Book two, part one of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book two, part one. Number one. With the break of day, the generals met and were surprised that Cyrus should not have appeared himself or at any rate have sent some one to tell them what to do. Accordingly, they resolved to put what they had together, to get under arms, and to push forward until they effected junction with Cyrus. Just as they were on the point of starting, with the rising sun came Procles, the ruler of Teuthrania. He was a descendant of Demaratus, the Laconian, and with him also came Glus, the son of Tamos. These two told them, first, that Cyrus was dead, next that Arias had retreated with the rest of the barbarians to the halting-place whence they had started at dawn on the previous day, and wished to inform them that, if they were reminded to come, he would wait for this one day, but on the morrow he should return home again to Ionia, whence he came. When they heard these tidings, the generals were sorely distressed. So, too, were the rest of the Hellenes when they were informed of it. Then Clearchus spoke as follows. Would that Cyrus were yet alive! But since he is dead, take back this answer to Arias, that we, at any rate, have conquered the king, and, as you yourselves may see, there is not a man left in the field to meet us. Indeed, had you not arrived, we should ere this have begun our march upon the king. Now we can promise to Arias that, if he will join us here, we will place him on the king's throne. Surely to those who conquer, empire pertains." With these words he sent back the messengers, and with them he sent Carasophus the Laconian, and Menon the Thessalian. That was what Menon himself wished, being, as he was, a friend and intimate of Arias, and bound by mutual ties of hospitality. So these set off, and Clearchus waited for them. The soldiers furnished themselves with food and drink as best they might, falling back on the baggage animals, and cutting up oxen and asses, there was no lack of firewood. They need only step forward a few paces from the line where the battle was fought, and they would find arrows to hand in abundance, which the Hellenes had forced the deserters from the king to throw away. There were arrows and wicker shields also, and the huge wooden shields of the Egyptians. There were many targets also, and empty wagons left to be carried off. Here was a stall which they were not slow to make use of, to cook their meat and serve their meals that day. It was now about full market hour when heralds from the king and Tissaphernes arrived. These were barbarians with one exception. This was a certain Phalanus, a Hellene who lived at the court of Tissaphernes, and was held in high esteem. He gave himself out to be a connoisseur of tactics and the art of fighting with heavy arms. These were the men who now came up, and having summoned the generals of the Hellenes, they delivered themselves of the following message. The great king, having won the victory and slain Cyrus, bids the Hellenes to surrender their arms, to betake themselves to the gates of the king's palace, and there obtain for themselves what terms they can. That was what the herald said, and the Hellenes listened with heavy hearts. But Clearchus spoke, and his words were few. Conquerors do not, as a rule, give up their arms. Then, turning to the others, he added, I leave it to you, my fellow generals to make the best and noblest answer that ye may to these gentlemen. I will rejoin you presently." At the moment an official had summoned him to come and look at the entrails which had been taken out, for, as it chanced, he was engaged in sacrificing. As soon as he was gone, Cleonor, the Arcadian, by right of seniority, answered, "'They would sooner die than give up their arms.' Then Proxenus the Theban said, for my part, I marvel if the king demands our arms as our master, or for the sake of friendship merely, as presents. If as our master, why need he ask for them, rather than come and take them? But if he would fain wheedle us out of them by fine speeches, he should tell us what the soldiers will receive in turn for such kindness. In answer to him, Phalanus said, The king claims to have conquered, because he has put Cyrus to death. And who is there now to claim the kingdom as against himself? He further flatters himself that you also are in his power, 
since he holds you in the heart of his country, hemmed in by impassable rivers, and he can at any moment bring against you a multitude so vast that even if leave were given to rise and slay, you could not kill them. After him Theopompus the Athenian spoke. Felonus, he said, at this instant, as you yourself can see, we have nothing left but our arms and our valour. If we keep the former, we imagine we can make use of the latter. But if we deliver up our arms, we shall presently be robbed of our lives. Do not suppose, then, that we are going to give up to you the only good things which we possess. We prefer to keep them, and by their help we will do battle with you for the good things which are yours. Phalanus laughed when he heard those words, and said, Spoken like a philosopher, my fine young man, and very pretty reasoning, too. Yet, let me tell you, your wits are somewhat scattered if you imagine that your valour will get the better of the king's power. There were one or two others, it was said, who, with a touch of weakness in their tone or argument, made answer. They had proved good and trusty friends to Cyrus, and the king might find them no less valuable. If he liked to be friends with them, he might turn them to any use that pleased his fancy, save for a campaign against Egypt. Their arms were at his service. They would help to lay that country at his feet. Just then Clearchus returned, and wished to know what answer they had given. The words were barely out of his mouth, before Phalanus, interrupting, answered, "'As for your friends here, one says one thing, and one another. Will you please give us your opinion?' And he replied, "'The sight of you, Phalanus, caused me much pleasure, and not only me, but all of us, I feel sure. For you are a Hellene, even as we are, every one of us whom you see before you. In our present plight we would like to take you into our counsel as to what we'd better do touching your proposals. I beg you then solemnly, in the sight of heaven, do you tender us such advice as you shall deem best and worthiest, and such as shall bring you honour of after-time, when it will be said of you how once on a time Phalanus was sent by the great king to bid certain Hellenes yield up their arms, and when they had taken him into their counsel he gave them such and such advice. You know that whatever advice you do give us cannot fail to be reported in Hellas. Clearchus threw out these leading remarks in hopes that this man, who was the ambassador from the king, might himself be led to advise them not to give up their arms, in which case the Hellenes would be still more sanguine and hopeful. But, contrary to his expectation, Phalanus turned round and said, I say that if you have one chance, one hope in ten thousand, to wage a war with the king successfully, do not give up your arms. That is my advice. If, however, you have no chance of escape without the king's consent, then, I say, save yourselves in the only way you can. And Clearchus answered, So then, that is your deliberate view? Well, this is our answer. Take it back. We conceive that in either case, whether we are expected to be friends with the king, we shall be worth more as friends if we keep our arms than if we yield them to another, or whether we are to go to war, we shall fight better with them than without. And Felinus said, That answer we will repeat, but the king bade me tell you this besides. Whilst you remain here there is truce, but one step forward or one step back, the truce ends, there is war. Will you then please inform us as to that point also? Are you minded to stop and keep truce, or is there to be war? What answer shall I take from you? And Clearchus replied, Pray answer that we hold precisely the same views on this point as the king. How say you the same views? asked Phalanus. Clearchus made answer, As long as we stay here there is truce. But a step forward or a step backward, the truce ends. There is war. The other again asked, Peace or war, what answer shall I make? Clearchus returned answer once again in the same words. Truce if we stop, but if we move forwards or backwards, war. But what he was minded really to do, that he refused to make further manifest. Number 2 Phalanus and those that were with him turned and went, but the messengers from Arias 
Proclus and Carisophus came back. As to Menon, he stayed behind with Arias. They brought back this answer from Arias. There are many Persians, he says, better than himself, who will not suffer him to sit upon the king's throne. But if you are minded to go back with him, you must join him this very night, otherwise he will set off himself to-morrow on the homeward route. And Clearchus said, It had best stand thus between us, then. If we come, well and good, be it as you propose. But if we do not come, do whatsoever you think most conducive to your interests. And so he kept these also in the dark as to his real intention. After this, when the sun was already sinking, he summoned the generals and officers, and made the following statement. Sirs, I sacrificed, and found the victims unfavourable to an advance against the king. After all, it is not so surprising, perhaps, for, as I now learn, between us and the king flows the river Tigris, navigable for big vessels, and we could not possibly cross it without boats, and boats we have none. On the other hand, to stop here is out of the question, for there is no possibility of getting provisions. However, the victims were quite agreeable to us joining the friends of Cyrus. This is what we must do, then. Let each go away and sup on whatever he has. At the first sound of the bugle to turn in, get kit and baggage together. At the second signal, place them on the baggage animals, and at the third, fall in and follow the lead, with the baggage animals on the inside protected by the river, and the troops outside. After hearing the orders, the generals and officers retired, and did as they were bid, and for the future Clearchus led, and the rest followed in obedience to his orders. Not that they had expressly chosen him, but they saw that he alone had the sense and wisdom requisite in a general, while the rest were inexperienced. Here, under cover of the darkness which descended, the Thracian Miltisythes, with forty horsemen and three hundred Thracian infantry, deserted to the king, but the rest of the troops, Clearchus leading and the rest following, in accordance with the orders promulgated, took their departure, and about midnight reached their first stage, having come up with Arias and his army. They grounded arms just as they stood in rank, and the generals and officers of the Hellenes met in the tent of Arias. There they exchanged oaths, the Hellenes on the one side, and Arias with his principal officers on the other, not to betray one another, but to be true to each other as allies. The Asiatics further solemnly pledged themselves by oath to lead the way without treachery. The oaths were ratified by the sacrifice of a bull, a wolf, a boar, and a ram over a shield. The Hellenes dipped a sword, the barbarians a lance, into the blood of the victims. As soon as the pledge was taken, Clearchus spoke. "'And now, Arias, he said, "'since you and we have one expedition in prospect, "'will you tell us what you think about the route? "'Shall we return the way we came, or have you devised a better?' He answered, "'To return the same way is to perish to a man by hunger, "'for at this moment we have no provisions whatsoever. "'During the seventeen last stages, even on our way hither, we could extract nothing from the country, or, if there was now and again anything, we passed over and utterly consumed it. At this time our project is to take another and a longer journey, certainly, but we shall not be in straits for provisions. The earliest stages must be very long, as long as we can make them. The object is to put as large a space as possible between us and the royal army. Once we are two or three days' journey off, the danger is over. The king will never overtake us. With a small army he will not dare to dog our heels, and with a vast equipment he will lack the power to march quickly. Perhaps he, too, may even find a scarcity of provisions. There, said he, you asked for my opinion. See, I have given it. Here was a plan of the campaign which was equivalent to a stampede. Helter-skelter they were to run away or get into hiding somehow. But fortune proved a better general for as soon as it was day they recommenced the journey keeping the sun on their right and calculated that with the westering rays they would have reached villages in the territory of babylonia and in this hope they were not deceived while it was yet afternoon they thought they caught sight of some of the enemy's cavalry and those of the hellenes who were not in rank ran to their ranks and arias who was riding in a wagon to nurse a wound got down and donned his cuirass the rest of his party following his example Whilst they were arming themselves, the scouts, who had been sent forward, 
came back with the information that they were not cavalry, but baggage animals grazing. It was at once clear to all that they must be somewhere in the neighbourhood of the king's encampment. Smoke could actually be seen rising, evidently from villages not far ahead. Clearchus hesitated to advance upon the enemy, knowing that the troops were tired and hungry, and indeed it was already late. On the other hand, he had no mind either to swerve from his route, guarding against any appearance of flight. Accordingly, he marched straight as an arrow, and with sunset entered the nearest villages with his vanguard and took up quarters. These villages had been thoroughly sacked and dismantled by the royal army, down to the very woodwork and furniture of the houses. Still, the vanguard contrived to take up their quarters in some sort of fashion, but the rear division, coming up in the dark, had to bivouac as best they could, one detachment after another, and a great noise they made, with hue and cry to one another, so that the enemy could hear them, and those in their immediate proximity actually took to their heels, left their quarters and decamped, as was plain enough next morning, when not a beast was to be seen, nor a sign of camp or wreath of smoke anywhere in the neighbourhood. The king, as it would appear, was himself quite taken aback by the advent of the army, as he fully showed by his proceedings next day. During the progress of this night the Hellenes had their turn of scare. A panic seized them, and there was a noise and clatter hardly to be explained except by the visitation of some sudden terror. But Clearchus had with him the Elean Tolmides, the best herald of his time. Him he ordered to proclaim silence, and then to give out this proclamation of the generals. Whoever will give any information as to who let an ass into the camp shall receive a talent of silver in reward. On hearing this proclamation, the soldiers made up their minds that their fear was baseless, and their generals safe and sound. At break of day, Clearchus gave the order to the Hellenes to get under arms in line of battle, and take up exactly the same position as they held on the day of the battle. End of Book Two, Part One